Now, they're calling it environmental genocide, and it centers around the findings of the Bielsa State International Oil and Environment Commission. The Commission has to date released a report on decades of environmental degradation and socio-economic collapse caused by oil exploration in the Niger Delta. Exploration that's left communities facing a severe health risk, with some families drinking contaminated water with high levels of carcinogenic hydrocarbons. 900 times above recommended levels. In some cases, the oil slick floating on the water was said to be several centimeters thick. So how do you go about cleaning up and restoring such a devastated region? Well, for more on this, I'm joined now by two members of the Bielsa State International Oil and Environment Commission that produced today's damning report. The Emeritus Professor of Geography and Development Studies, Michael J. Watts, whose extensive work includes research in the oil and gas industry, energy security, resource development and land reform in Africa. And Dr. Isaac Osume Osuoka, Coordinator of Social Action International, an organization that promotes resource democracy and the human rights of marginalized communities in West Africa. Thank you very much indeed to both of you for coming in. Let me start with you, um, Professor Watts. Uh, you were a member of that commission. What were its main findings it's contained in that report that you released today? It sounds like a detailed study. It is a detailed study, and as you implied in your opening remarks, there have been many studies of this sort, going back to the 1990s, actually, the Agoni area in particular. Mm. Uh, the United Nations produced various reports, UNEP and UNDP, but this report was actually different. It was the first systematic, statewide scientific study of the ecological and public health footprint of the industry. And to that extent, the commission included a group of experts, including ourselves and lawyers and public policy experts and so on and so forth. And we commissioned our own research by forensic environmental researchers from Nigeria, from the United Kingdom and so on, including public health. And we conducted these very detailed granular studies across the state. And to be very candid, the situation was much worse than we had even anticipated. You mentioned that the title of the volume of the report is Environmental Genocide. Mm. This is not a word that one throws around lightly. So, for example, we found at the level of looking and examining the government data on oil spills that in Bielsa State since 2006 there have been over 3,500 spills, roughly two and a 250 every year. That's we extraordinary. Found. It's extraordinary. Mm. We also found, for example, that if you look at the leakages mm. uh, of pipelines per thousand kilometers, they are in Bielsa uh, 500 times higher than the European Union. But in a sense, that's not the real findings, because the real findings, as you implied earlier, were looking at the toxicity levels. Mm across all of the oil host communities we worked in. And we looked at groundwater, we looked at surface water and the creeks, and we did a public health study. 1,600 people had blood samples drawn. And the picture, honestly, is utterly devastating. Just, just to give you a couple of qu very quick examples. Sure. One, uh, the groundwater and surface water contamination in every single community, which we did scientific studies, was more than 100 times higher than the World Health Organization's recommended safety levels. In some communities, they were more than 300,000 times. That's extraordinary. I mean, these figures are astonishing. Yeah, that's very, very worrying. Uh, let me come to you. Um, because you were part of this study, um, I mean, this sort of report. Um, I've, he was talking about, you know, some of the, the levels of, of the, the devastation. I mean, I understand some families have been drinking contaminated water, you know, containing dangerous, very poisonous carcinogens. Um, I imagine that that's left quite a lot of people very sick as a result well, uh, over the years. 
Yes, people have been complaining about uh, unusual illnesses mm. in, in, in the communities. Uh, we went around all the local government areas in, in Bielsa State and spoke to people in those communities, and they, they, they report that they've been having unusual ailments. You know, the cancer rate mm. is, is very high. But until now, uh, even though uh, people have suspected that uh, this, is, this health crisis is related to the oil pollution, we've not seen any any data, you know, right. scientific data, which is obviously very you know, important. To link, to link to, right. to, to, to and of course, beyond just natural. the people. I mean, you've got you know whole ecosystems ravaged. You know, it's 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 an outrage. It's mm. an outrage to see what, what has happened. And you know, sometimes uh, people pay attention to the oil spills, which are devastating as they are. Mm. You know, but there's also gas flaring. You know, that is that is going on. That has been going on for you know, over sixty years continuously. And and the way that uh, that, that the, the vegetation have been decimated, you know, to construct, you know, a, a pipeline right of way, you mm. know, as, as it's also been, it's also a source, source of uh, destruction uh, and that has impacted on, on people. So it's not just pollution, there's, you know, there are multifaceted ways, right. you know, that the, that the oil industry, you know, but collectively all, all, you know, it's been you know, a disaster. Impact on, right. on the people and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, it's shocking, right. you know, uh, that uh, the oil international oil companies know that uh, you know that, that actually the activities you know are causing so much damage, and and at the state, the state, the federal government, you know, understands that this 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 is it's going on, and nothing nothing has been nothing has been done, and so right. we, we only hope, you know, that uh, with this report that this will be a, a wake up, mm. you know, a wake up call for all the authorities, you know, concerned to do something, you know, and, uh, and to see that look this cannot be business as usual. Right. You know. Well, just looking further, uh, Professor Watts, uh, at, at what is responsible and who is responsible for this. I mean, is it the oil companies who failed to create and apply public health and safety controls and, and perhaps mechanisms around their own production? Is it the Nigerian government, which is the regulator, um, the state government or all of the above? Well, it's a complicated question, mm. but certainly the international oil companies have to take a large measure of the blame for this. And this operates at very many levels. But on the other hand, it's true that you, as you were suggesting, that there have been profound regulatory failures mm. at federal and state levels. And the two operate synonymously. If the oil companies know that regulations are weak or not enforced, mm. they simply will get away with whatever they can they will not uh, provide the necessary security and prevention measures and oversight, for example, uh, of increasingly aging infrastructure. We discovered, incidentally, when we did our own analysis of the oil and gas sector, that much of this infrastructure is extraordinarily old and it's not been renovated and updated. Right. So it's a combination, in my view, of that regulatory failure, and a part of that is a regulatory failure because the agencies themselves don't have the resources to do it. Let me give you just one little illustration. In order to determine what happens in the wake of an oil spill, the Nigerian government has a process called the Joint Investigation Committee. Mm. You send out representatives of the oil company, the regulatory agencies, and you interact with civil society groups and local community representatives to determine the cause, the extent, the volume, and so on and so forth. And what we discovered is that in many cases, there was no budget within the regulatory agency. It was the oil companies that did this, sometimes unrepresented by the regulatory agencies and the local oil communities themselves had really no idea what was going on. So when you see those numbers, mm. oh yes, oil spills, 85 to 90% of that is vandalization. What we an analyzed shows that you have to be very careful because it's a product of that very leaky, compromised right. JIV process. Well, he, he mentioned the issue of vandalization. I mean, is there a, an element, I mean, because obviously we have to be as objective as possible, I mean, and, and in your assessment, your report as well, is there an element of local complicity as well? Because we know that local people have been sabotaging pipelines in order to steal oil, and they're doing it on a fairly large scale, aren't they? Well, uh, we, we, the, the, the commission examined the, the reality of the existence of uh, artisanal 
oil refiner mm. refineries, you know, and uh, recognizing that uh, there are quite a bit of them, you know, in all all the states in, in the Niger Delta. Uh, but the the reality is that that is quite recent. Uh, we didn't have artisanal refineries until you know maybe about ten years ago, and this was a response to uh, a scarcity of fuel, you know, lack of access to energy. You know, and people who have been who have been marginalized, people who have who have lost their livelihoods, you know, young people, some of them university graduates without access to employment, you know, and looking at ways to survive and taking advantage of, you know, the, the, the scarcity of, of fuel in, 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 the, in the market to refine. This is contributing, this is contributing, you know, without doubt to the, the, the pollution mm. in, in the area. But we need to look, we need to look at the whole, the whole infrastructure see the infrastructure of security it is a responsibility it should be the responsibility of the of the oil companies to protect you know their their, their infra infrastructure mm. in most in in, in, in many places this 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 infrastructure are exposed are, are exposed you know we have pipelines in people's backyards and also you know? it's the Nigerian government's responsibility to provide security to secure those lines aren't they Exactly, and what we have heard, right. you know, in every community that we visited, that the security agencies are complicit in in in, in the in, in the stealing of crude oil. Where, where, you know, by the way, you know, the community people are telling us everywhere that we go, you know, that the the small scale. You know, stealing of, of uh, crude oil for local refining to provide access to local uh, 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 energy, but the larger scale, the larger scale, you know, theft of crude mm. oil is organized by people that are very well connected to security, because we are not talking about we're not just talking about you know the barrels. In, in this case, people are using <coughs> barges and ships mm. to take away yes, oil, we, we, and we it, is, it is impossible for you to have ships. Yeah. You know, just taking away, you know, you know, if, if there wasn't, if, if there was complicity, if, if, if the security 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 forces, people in the yeah. navy, people in the army are not involved in this kind of business, mm. businesses. You know, so we have to look at look at this. That look, there's, there's security failure, there's regulatory failure, and what we hear, you know, instead is that victims, victims of pollution, victims of marginalization, victims of 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 uh, this outrage are the ones who have been blamed. Mm. You know. That's a very important point. And it's also important, Professor, isn't it, in the fight against oil pollution to also, I mean, it doesn't matter where you apportion the blame, curb illegal refining and the sabotaging of pipeline. Because, of course, all oil spills are bad. It doesn't matter who is behind it, irrespective of how they happened or who is responsible. Absolutely. It, uh, the report would have failed if we did not acknowledge, for example, the explosion of artisanal refining, mm. as it's called. Um, this is relatively small scale, but its impact on the environment is absolutely devastating. And if you take a look, for example, if you read the newspapers every week, the NMPC or the security forces will say we discovered another 125 artisanal refineries. Right. There are thousands across the delta. And it's expanded because of the desperate nature of rural and urban livelihoods in that mm. region. So yes, you're absolutely right. We have to account for that impact and likewise vandalizations. Um, but again, this doesn't, I don't think, detract from the fact that this must be put on a larger landscape sure. of, uh, yeah. of a long-term neglect of the region. I mentioned that there were two, three and a half thousand oil spills since 2006. The vast expansion of oil production occurred in the 1970s. We almost have no record in the 70s and 80s, even up until the 90s, of how many spills there were. So you can get a sense then of why this neglect of the region right. is producing these sorts of phenomena. So based on these findings, um, are you advising the people of those areas to seek compensation? Yes, we are. Uh, we have a number of recommendations, uh, too many to go through here, but I would encourage your viewers to um, go online and read them in this uh, powerful uh, re um, report. Uh, but I will just mention one, and the first one, in fact, is to say if things are as bad as we have documented, you need a very large-scale recovery plan. And that recovery is multifaceted. You've mentioned compensation. If people have, in fact, lost the long-term use of their land, that requires compensation. Mm. 
whether it requires compensation or not, an oil spill and the degradation that it incurs requires some type of long-term remediation. This cannot happen in a weekend, quite the reverse. It's a long and complicated process. And if you put all of these remediative, rehabilitation, mm. and the reparations and compensation for damage done, we calculated using a, a group of economists that this recovery fund for Bielsa alone, and bear in mind, this is only about Bielsa, there's yeah. no reason to believe it's any different in Delta or Rivers, would require an investment of 12 billion US dollars. That's extraordinary. I mean, that would scare anybody away, even if they, they were keen on trying to, you know, get the land remediated and the people compensated. But, I mean, there have been a slew of international reports and court rulings that have found in favor of the people of the Niger Delta. Does that make it easier for the victims contained in, in this, your report? Um, because it makes admission of liability on the part of the sort of the oil companies and all the rest of them easier as a result of all the precedents that have been we, set. We, we, we hope um, that uh, victims of, of pollution uh, will, will use this, mm -hmm. the evidence that has been gathered in this, this report uh, to seek redress, uh, including through litigation. Uh, when we presented the report to the government of uh, Bi the government of, and the people of Bayelsa State mm. in Yenagua on, on Monday, the governor made a commitment to support communities to seek redress, you know, including using the, the courts. And uh, you know, we expect we think that that is a good way to to go. Uh, we're talking about uh, litigation. Uh, we recognize that litigation can be carried out uh, within Nigeria and in internationally. Mm. Uh, over the years, and that's one of the issues that uh, this report identified, is that the Nigerian courts have been making it very difficult for communities to seek justice. You know, the oil companies know how to manipulate the legal system, you know, just keep cases in court sometimes for decades. Litigants sometimes die, you know, and their, their children and grandchildren remain in court just to seek, seek justice for, for destruction of their livelihoods. Uh, there have been few cases, few cases, you know, where litigants have taken, uh, gone to court in the United Kingdom or in the Netherlands and, mm. and got injustice. But one of the things that is important that, that we need to address is the issue of uh, the selling of, of assets on onshore assets by international oil companies. Uh, what we have recommended is, is, is that uh, as much as possible, uh, the Nigerian regulatory authorities should suspend asset divestment by international oil companies until these issues are addressed. You know, right. Because we, we believe that the polluter pay principle must stand if uh, Shell or other companies in right. the IGP you know, sell up their assets to, okay. to Nigerian companies and, and walk away. It means that they have, you know, there's possibility that they're going to evict liability, right. you know, for, for, every, for everything that they have done. And so it would be important, you know, that uh, the federal government of Nigeria look at this as a matter of natural importance, that the, the, the livelihood, the health, you know, of its own citizens in Bayelsa State, and we believe elsewhere, you know, needs to be protected. Right. And that it is not, it is not, it is not uh, good, you know, for the, for the companies to just, okay. just walk away. Okay. We, we thank you very much indeed to both of you. Thank I you. appreciate your taking the time to come and talk to us about this very important thing. Dr. Isaac Osume Osuoka is a coordinator of so, uh, Social Action International. Uh, they promote resource democracy and the human rights of marginalized communities in West Africa. And uh, Professor Michael Watts is an emeritus professor of geography and development studies. His extensive work includes research in the oil and gas industry, energy security, resource development and land reform in Africa. Thank you very much indeed to both of you. Thank you. That's it for this edition of Arise Prime Time. Join us again tomorrow. From me and the entire team here in Abuja and Port Harcourt, bye-bye and thank you for watching.